Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 29th of March to the 4th of April, 2021. Before getting started with the news, I would like to send a special shout out to our good friends at Spacewatch.Global and at GoTikonauts, two excellent sources of space industry news. This week, we bring you updates from both Guangzhou and Wuhan on a variety of local ongoings in these two cities. But first, of the 20 different Chinese launch companies that we have been giving updates on, we have at least four significant launch updates this week, and so Jean will lead us with the four launch updates from four different commercial launch companies. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. So the first piece of news this week is about launch, and actually it's multiple significant updates about commercial launch companies in China. There are actually four, so I'll try to keep it short on each of them. The first one is from Landspace, which completed a 4,000 second hot fire engine test of their TQ11 engine, or the Tianque 11 engine, which is a methlox engine that's designed to be uh, reusable and that has a thrust of 10 tons. And this engine is meant to power the second stage of the um, Jutre 2 small to medium lift reusable liquid fueled rocket by Landspace. And so 4,000 seconds, that's that's a lot of time. 4,000 seconds, that's over an hour. And that's much more than the general operation time that these engines would be running uh, on board an actual launch of um, of Jutre 2. And this is probably because they were testing uh, the reliability of the engine, so making it run a very long time. And the article from Landspace also mentions that this was after another a successful batch of tests, which included simulating different regimes of flight, mix, uh, different mixing ratios in the combustion chamber, uh, testing autogenous uh, pressurization, as well as thrust vectoring. And so it looks like we're really getting closer and closer to the maiden launch of the Jutria 2, which is bound to happen this year. And actually, if it happens soon enough, it could be the very first Methalox rocket to be launched into orbit, not just in China, but in the entire world, because uh, we we can I mean what SpaceX currently is doing is is suborbital hops right and uh, of of course um, SpaceX is moving very fast so um, definitely land space will have to move fast to to try and catch that title and of course unfortunately for land space they also have a domestic competitor called iSpace, which this week successfully completed a 500 second hot fire engine test of their Jiaodian One Methlox engine and so. Um, what this test consisted in mostly was throttling the engine to d- different levels of thrust, going from 100% all the way down to 50% by increments of 10%. And th- playing on the thrust of the engine, this is crucial a crucial building block for having a vertical takeoff, vertical landing um, rocket, notably for the landing phase. And so the Jiaodian 1 powers the Hyperbola 2, which is some sort of competitor to the um, la- land space Jutria 2, although it does have a slighter, smaller, significantly smaller payload capacity. And iSpace is planning a first hop of the Hyperbola 2 before the end of this year. And so it's also nice to know a difference here between iSpace and Landspace. Landspace plans to make their uh, rocket expendable at the beginning and then at a later later stage, make the rocket reusable. iSpace, on the other hand, uh, plans to be reusable on day one with their Hyperbola 2 rocket. So um, that's that's interesting. And there's also a third kid on the block called Jojo Unjin, also JZYJ, and which is a company that we mentioned in January this year because due to another round of funding that they raised. And so they did a hot fire test of their Long Yun engine. And so this engine is much heavier thrust, 80 tons. It's also a Methlox engine and also plans to be reusable. And this, this company is much more early stage than iSpace and Landspace. And you can see it from their test. This test, I think, was the first full-fledged test of their Long Yun engine. And the idea was testing the gas generator, which, um, you know, runs the turbo power pumps and which will then inject fuel into the combustion chamber and so it's testing that all of these building blocks of the entire engine work together um, correctly and so um so yeah you can probably expect many more tests to come up on the engine uh, in the near future and so another point also here i'd like to mention to differentiate uh, jojo and jen from the other uh, two launch launch companies mentioned previously jojo and jen actually they're planning to be an engine manufacturer so they don't actually build entire rockets but they will for example provide their ling yun engine uh, which is another engine that they produce um to link space a startup that's building 
um, a reusable launch vehicle test prototype, the T6, um, which will potentially do some hops at an unknown date. They haven't announced it, but probably soon because this has been in in discussions for at least two years. And so that's for Jojo and Jen. The last um, launch update from this week is from Caspace. So Caspace is a spin-off of the China Academy of Sciences. It's based in Beijing, Xi'an, and Guangzhou. And it's building the uh, Zhongke rocket series, which includes liquid-fueled and solid-fueled rockets. And so very interestingly, this week, they tested a 23-kilogram vertical takeoff, vertical landing prototype in Shandong. And this was for future sea-based launches and landing. And um, so this was one of their very first VTVL tests. And so what they were doing is um, basic flight control characterization. They were looking at um, the stability of the flight, the robustness. They were doing simple horizontal and vertical uh, movements. And we saw during this report on CASPACE this week that an engineer, a senior engineer from the CAS Institute of, uh, of Mechanics Space Flight Technology Center, Lian Jia, say that the results that they got were extremely promising and that this sea-based VTVL launch would enable them to, first of all, cut the cost of launch by 30%. So I think that's more linked to the reusability component rather than to the sea-based launch component. But second point, um, the fact that they're doing sea-based launch, this would be would enable them to uh, reduce the lead time of launch by 50%. So definitely very significant as well if things go accordingly. And uh, last two points I want to mention on cast space before handing it over to Blaine is that Shandong uh, where this experiment was led is also the area where, um, you know, Long March 11, the other sea-based launched uh, vehicle in China is being launched from the from the port of Haiyang, right? And um, second point, it's it's also very intriguing to see that in this report on cast space, we have Lian Jie, the senior engineer from the Institute of Mechanics, just discuss uh, the experiment so much. So it's, I mean, clearly the CAS Institute of Mechanics is collaborating very closely with CAS Space. And this is just another example of, uh, you know, on one side, a public research institute, the CAS Institute of Mechanics Space Flight Technology Center, work closely with CAS Space, which is a private commercial startup. Now, obviously, as the name suggests, they have very close connections. CAS Space is a spinoff of that Institute of Mechanics. A lot of people come from the former institute. Um, but, you know, just another example that public-private space, you know, relationships are not necessarily confrontational. In this case, they can also be extremely collaborative. So, um, so yeah, that's for my four pieces of news this week. Um, any, any reactions to that, Blaine? A lot to unpack on this very fast-moving horse race of, uh, of Chinese commercial launch companies. And again, it's like, you know, you know you have several dozen companies when you're getting four significant updates in the course of of a week. Um, just a couple of small points to um, to add to this this very uh, very thorough summary. So um, impressive uh, impressive progress, I think, so far by uh, by Jiu Jiu Yunjian uh, J J J Y J Z Y J. We know that's uh, is my 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 favorite uh, my favorite rocket launch company name. They really should uh, should look into a look into that. But digressing, um, impressive uh, impressive progress by them, as you uh, alluded to earlier. Um, they had completed a hundred million RMB round of funding earlier this year. Um, they have, uh, as, as you'd mentioned as well, the um, the deal with with Link Space, and uh, as we also mentioned a couple of weeks ago on on our podcast here, uh, here um, they are apparently one of the suppliers for the the newly announced uh, launch company uh, Huojianpai. Uh, the uh, rocket group, I think, is uh, based in Huzhou. And again, one of the very few pieces of information that we have about Rocket Group is that they will be, uh, they have a deal with, uh, with Jiu Jiu Yunjian for their, uh, I think it's the Ling Yun engine. Um, not entirely clear, you know, how, how concrete of a deal that is, given how very new of a company uh, Huo Jianpai is. But um, nonetheless, it, interesting that, again, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Jiu Jiu Yunjian really taking this, um, this, this approach of being an engine supplier as opposed to a, a turnkey launch company. Um, one other additional point about the uh, the video from Landspace, as you said, it's uh, more than an hour long test, uh, four thousand seconds, and and I thought it was a very, very well done video in the sense that it shows about a minute, minute and a half of of the rocket, uh, or of the engine, I guess, uh, doing um, doing testing and kind of having um, a little bit of, of I guess gimbling is the the word if I'm not wrong of the the uh, yeah, and uh, and then there's just a, a sort of um, in Chinese it, there's a, a black screen, and then the words about one hour later come up, and then. It goes back to the the engine that is still just firing at the exact same, you know, in the same way that it was firing one hour ago. Um, and again, I, I thought it was just uh, it, it was pretty, you know, subtly clever marketing, I guess. And I saw quite a few people within my 
my WeChat contacts liking that uh, that video. So again, well done to uh, to Landspace on that. Um, and again, it's looking like 2021 is going to be a uh, a really big year in in Chinese commercial launch based on on the number of updates that we're seeing uh, just in the first quarter alone. Um, so with that being said, uh, we do have one additional launch update this week, although it is bundled with a few other pieces of space industry news, all related to uh, Wuhan, Hubei province. So, uh, Jean, would you like to take us over to uh, to Wuhan and fill us in on what has been going on there in the last week? Sure. We have a we had a TV report this week uh, that was published by the Hubei News, so um, a, a news outlet that's based in Hubei province in central China. And this was on the Wuhan space project, so Wuhan being the capital of Hubei. And so a lot of interesting takeaways, notably on the Xingyun narrowband constellation, and as Blaine said, and, and also the on launch on the X-Space commercial launch company. And so... Um, I'll, I'll cover launch since we've, yeah, as I mean, we've already been talking about launch uh, this morning. Um, so first thing here, uh, the report reminds us of a lot of interesting facts that admittedly were already known. Firstly, that X-Space uh, defense, you know, spinoff of uh, the defense contractor Kasich has massively invested in a digital factory to produce the Kwaizhou rockets in Wuhan. And so we see in this report a lot of cool shots of uh, the Kwaizhou rockets and only four rock Kwaizhou rockets being assembled in this digital factory. Um, we also learned that, but we already knew that, that the factory has a capacity of building up to 20 rockets um, per year. And that the next Kwaizhou 1A rocket that would be launched uh, would be called Xinzhou, which is the name of the district where the factory, uh, the Kwaizhou factory is based. And perhaps more bizarre and intriguing is this passage that I'll put up on YouTube. And so um, you hear, so I'm not sure you necessarily pick this up, but in the video, he says at multiple times, the reporter, he says, Yeti, so Yeti, Falongji, Yeti, Huajian. And so what this means is liquid fueled um, engines, liquid fueled rockets. And he's actually talking about the development of a liquid fueled rocket by X Space. And this is very intriguing because X Space is known to be a manufacturer of solid fueled rockets. And this makes sense in the sense that it's a spin off of uh, Kasik. And Kasik is basically a missile manufacturer. And we know that missiles. Uh, very often times they use solid field rockets, especially in China, because, I mean, you can't have missiles based on Carolox or Hydrolox or, um, you know, or, or Methlox engines, right? So, yeah, X-Space mainly a solid field rocket manufacturer. But last year, for the very first time, we seem to see the first hints of X-Space thinking about building liquid field rockets. So there was this webinar uh, that popped up uh, in the second half of 2020, where we see X-Space discussing a family of liquid field rockets called the Kwaijo 2. And um, again, in this report, we see them talking about liquid field rockets and how uh, this digital factory would enhance the uh, R&D capabilities for uh, liquid fueled rockets. And this would be ready uh, by, by the second half of 2021, the R&D capabilities. And we also saw in some of the screenshots from the reporter who visited the factory uh, last week that uh, we, we have a backdrop in the factory and we, we see multiple um, Kwaizhou rocket models. And one of them uh, in the backdrop, several of them actually are these Kwaizhou 2s. And so uh, again, another hint that... Um, from several paces that, um, you know, X-Space is really looking at um, potentially having liquid fueled rockets. And this would definitely be a very big event in the landscape of Chinese launch, because commercial launch, because, you know, a, a player as, you know, well-funded and important as X-Space building liquid fueled rockets, that is going to be significant competition to um, to companies like Landspace or iSpace. And, and also you have the fact that X-Space, I mean, they're able to, since they have a constellation, similarly to SpaceX, I mean, they have their constellation, they have a launch vehicle, so they're able to put payloads from their own constellation. Mm -hmm. And um, and we know that um, economies of scale in terms of launching multiple rockets um, is, is definitely a significant factor in bringing the costs of launch down. So, yeah, um, that's I think that was a big takeaway from this uh, TV report. And a very good segue, because, you know, what kind of satellites are they building over there at Kasich? Well, they are building, uh, among other things, the Xingyun constellation, which is uh, a narrowband constellation of, um, I believe, 78 satellites, although that could be plus or minus. But basically, it is considered uh, sort of a Chinese version of Iridium, which is to say a low Earth orbit narrowband uh, with some kind of um, global narrowband constellation. Um, so... 
uh, again, John, to your point, um, there's a lot of activity going on in Wuhan uh, related to Kasich. And um, yes, yeah, Xingyun is, is one of their bigger projects. And so this week we heard from uh, the VP of Xingyun, uh, Zhang Yong, who basically confirmed a couple of interesting things that uh, that we can derive some some insights from on, on what they're up to. Uh, so first, uh, Mr. Zhang, he, he confirmed that they're going to launch the next batch of six Xingyun satellites within 2021 using a Kuaijo 11 rocket. So this getting to your point, John, about, you know, Kasich having a degree of vertical integration. They are launching their own payloads on their own rockets. Um, and so this is interesting because uh, previously, as recently as late 2020 at the China Commercial Aerospace Forum, which is hosted by, by Kasich, um, Xing Yud had mentioned having plans to have two batches of six or you know, 12 satellites launched during 2021. So we can view this initially as a, a setback of sorts in the sense that they appear to be launching six as opposed to 12. Um, that being said, the other part of this statement from uh, from Mr. Zhang was quite interesting, which is that they are planning to be six uh, Xingyun-3 satellites, which I don't know if, if Xingyun-3, the concept has been around for, for well, this may be the first we're hearing about it, John. I, I don't know if you've uh, seen it before. I, I certainly have not. Um, but basically the idea of kind of a... a uh, th sort of an upgrade to the previous Xingyun 2 satellites uh, implicitly in, in terms of just sort of different technologies. And and this is, again, kind of similar to the, the Western constellations, most notably SpaceX, in the sense that you have this um, iterative innovation, albeit at a much smaller scale. You know, you had SpaceX launching, uh, you know, some 60 or, or, you know, a couple hundred satellites and then iterating on those. Um, Xingyun, it appears, has launched a couple of satellites uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, and are now, again, uh, making iterative improvements on those satellites uh, in the form of this Xingyun-3. So basically, um, we assume that uh, that Xingyun is, uh, is going to see fewer satellites launched in 2021, but that those are going to be more advanced satellites. Uh, and just to give a little bit of a, a insight as to you know, how much more advanced, uh, Mr. Ya uh, Zhang had referred to very significant technological upgrades and also said that each satellite can serve up to 750,000 terminals compared to 320,000 for the previous version. So, um, you know, a little more than half as, as capable, we could assume, compared to, uh, to Xingyun 2. And uh, just a bit of speculation from my side is that I, I do think in the past year to year and a half, as the scale of these broadband mega constellations have gotten much, much larger in the sense that, you know, had you approached someone two years ago and told them that Starlink would have 1200 satellites in orbit now in 2021 they would say that that that's pretty crazy um and yet here we are i think that this has made it very apparent to the chinese leadership that if they want to have a a global sort of starlink type constellation they need to think very big and that in the meantime it may be helpful to have a global iridium type constellation so i do think that this is indicative potentially of um you know more emphasis being given to to xingyun um as china has now kind of confirmed the the larger broadband constellation as a kind of separate project. So um, definitely an interesting, uh, interesting couple of updates from uh, from the Wuhan National Aerospace Industrial Base and Kasich. Um, a couple of final points from my side, and then we will head over to Guangzhou for the last update of the week. Um, so I, I do think it's it's worth looking at and noting at um, the extent to which Kasich, and, uh, well, I guess in this case, X-Base and, and Xingyun um, have shown their factories to be quite high tech, quite automated, very um, you know, sort of industrial IoT enabled, this type of thing. And I suspect that this is to some extent a, um, a sort of testing ground or kind of a, a showcase uh, for Kasich of their broader kind of industrial IoT type of product line or initiatives. And this is also similar, I think, with their um, their their virtual conference from last year, which was on the Kasich cloud, um, I guess, cloud software. Uh, uh, so yeah, basically, you, you go to Kasich cloud, and, and that is uh, sort of that is where the conference is, uh, is, is located now. And um, so that, that brings me to the, the very last update related to Kasich in Wuhan is that I was very happy to find earlier this week when doing some research, uh, that the virtual exhibition hall from that conference in Wuhan on Kasich Cloud is back up and running. And it was uh, it was down for a couple of months for me. So I don't know if that was just me. But um, for any of you who are interested, we will put a link in the show notes. So that's all from Wuhan. Um, John, anything else from your side? Or do you want to uh, take us over to uh, to Nansha and uh, update us on, on that, uh, the updates there? Yeah, let's move on to to Nansha. So speaking of satellite manufacturing, satellite constellations, we must talk about Geely. So Geely um, is a, a very large automobile manufacturer in China, which has diversified into satellite manufacturing. 
um, since 2019, basically. And we saw this week in an international investment conference in Guangzhou that Geely announced that they would set foot in the uh, southern district of Guangzhou called Nansha. And this is significant here. Uh, there are two aspects that I want to comment. The first one is that um, they're following the footsteps of CAS Space. So CAS Space launch company mentioned previously that was initially based in Beijing and also uh, with um, offices in, in, in Xi'an and that moved to Guangzhou starting last year. And so, uh, so Geely is following the footsteps of CAS Space. And it's interesting because this is, first of all, a major win for Guangzhou. Um, Guangzhou and just southern China more generally, as mentioned in past episodes, it's not an area of China that is known for its space industry. It has it's more known for um, electronics, for uh, the tech industry, uh, for robotics, this sort of stuff. Definitely compared to the size of its economy, uh, the south, southern China and the greater Bay Area rather had underwhelming space activity. So notably Guangzhou. And um, we could see Guangzhou here. We have a satellite manufacturer that would settle there. We also have launch a launch company with CS Space. Potentially, we could see Guangzhou, if, this, if they continue to attract space companies the way they are doing, we could see them emerge as uh, one of the main space um, hubs in China alongside maybe Shanghai or Xi'an or Wuhan or Changsha, right? And the second point I want to mention here is that what Geely doing, is doing here is not just opening some random subsidiary in Guangzhou. They're actually basing their headquarters of all their space activities in uh, Guangzhou. So they're creating a new company, it would be called Shikong Tansuo. And Shikong Tansuo, this company would be controlling and operating all the other uh, space uh, subsidiaries that Geely has set up over the last two years. So G Space, notably for satellite manufacturing in Zhejiang and Taizhou. Uh, we also have Shanghai Aerospace mentioned previously, that's based in Qingdao. And also, very interestingly, they mentioned two other companies, especially one, which is Space OK, which I did not know was directly operated by, by Geely. But that's definitely a point of interest here that was um, that was in the article. Definitely. Yeah. And um, as you said, this is a uh, pretty big news. I mean, this is the, the headquarters of Geely's entire space operation, which is seemingly getting to be quite large. And uh, and, and I guess it's an interesting the timing is interesting in the sense that the the satellite factory that was just completed in, in Taizhou has only recently gotten um, a license from the NDRC to, to manufacture satellites. But but again, just um, a big big announcement for sure. So so a couple of um, of other points to to unpack. Definitely agree that uh, I was not aware that Space OK had been uh, kind of absorbed by Geely Space Operations. So um, as we may have mentioned on previous episodes, um, the general manager of Gi Space's Taijo operations is, uh, is Wang Yang, who was the former head of, of Space OK. Um, I would also point out that Space OK, it is a um, it is a spinoff from the CAS. And so it's just an interesting precedent that you might, you know, you'd have Geely, which is a commercial company kind of absorbing the technology of what was originally a CAS spin, you know, it's a CAS spinoff. So they're apparently absorbing some technology from the CAS. Uh, I suppose not terribly surprising then that uh, this is the same area as as CAS space, and uh, I'm sure there are some connections to to be drawn there. Um, one other point to mention about um, about Geely's operations in in Guangzhou and and in Nansha more specifically. Um, so this was mentioned by uh, by Twitter user Ilya Karlamov. Uh, so thank you for that, Ilya. Um, mentioned that there will there will be excellent transport between Nansha Nansha and Wanchang, and I'm not sure whether that's uh, sarcastic or not, but it got me thinking either way. And uh, we'll put up a map here on on the video here. Uh, but basically, you have uh, Nansha in, in Guangzhou is located pretty much right next to the uh, the mouth of the Pearl River Delta, which opens up right out into the South China Sea. And so just to put up a slightly larger map and show you where is Wenchang, which is, of course, where there's the, the large launch center, um, it is a you know relatively straight line uh, going directly from the mouth of the Pearl River Delta across the, the South China Sea to, to Hainan. So it's about 600 kilometers. And and again, just more of a, of a thought exercise. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of an industrial base in Guangzhou. There's a lot of, uh, of, of you know, yeah, human uh, human capital. There's a lot of money. Basically, it's a much bigger place in almost every way than uh, than Hainan from an economic and technological perspective. And so, um, again, I, I'm not sure that they will be ferrying uh, satellites and or rockets from uh, from Nansha to, to Wenchang anytime soon. But um, who knows? Maybe they'll head up the coast instead to the uh, apparent potential commercial launch site that's being built mm -hmm. in, in Ningbo, which is also just, I guess, similar distance to the northeast. Um, 
but anyway, I think that's about all from uh, from this week. Nothing else from Guangzhou on my side. John, anything from you? Are we all good? Oh, I was I was thinking, how do you? That that might be a tricky thing for Gili. You know, setting headquarters in Guangzhou. How do you move all the key? They'll they'll probably have to move a lot of um, high profile managers from Taizhou, from maybe from Qingdao, from other places. And how I, I guess it's tricky to move all these people to Guangzhou. It's not that easy to move. Um, people in China, I think, once you're above 35 or 40, especially since as soon as people have bought real estate, especially when you're in areas where real, real estate is a bit pricey, it's, it's starting to be a bit difficult to move people. So definitely mm. setting the actual headquarters there and not, um, that means I guess they won't entirely be hire, hiring locally. That might be a challenge. Yeah. And I guess just one, one other point to add there and something that you hear quite a lot in, in Hong Kong um, you know, Nansha is seen as, um, this is getting quite local, I guess, but, you know, Nansha is seen as, you know, this, this area that is, uh, you know, quite south of, of Guangzhou. So like if you were in the era where, where it was still several hours to go from Guangzhou to Hong Kong, uh, this would have been kind of way down in, in the sort of boondocks part of, of Guangzhou. Um, but now you have the high speed rail that's going from basically from Hong Kong up through Shenzhen and then into Guangzhou, but going via Nansha. And so Nansha, I think, is being seen now as kind of this um, this part of Guangzhou that that is developing southward towards the the rest of the kind of the I guess the Greater Bay Area uh, or kind of the rest of the of those cities. Uh, I guess primarily Shenzhen and uh, and Hong Kong. Um, so so again, I guess um, it's possible that those people who have just settled down in Taizhou are now being sold the uh, the story of oh well you know you'd, you'd be coming to. A place that's uh, you know rapidly evolve, uh, rapidly developing as the the sort of conduit between uh, between Guangzhou and, and Shenzhen and, and eventually down into Hong Kong, um, maybe. But uh, certainly, I have heard about a couple of different uh, mainland friends here looking at Nansha real estate as a speculative investment. So, uh, on that note, um, if anyone from Gi Space is looking for Nansha real estate, I could probably point you in the right direction. I don't know if you'd want that advice or not from. Uh, from someone in my my position, but uh, anyway, that's um, that's all from my side. Anything else, John, from uh, from your side this week? Or are we I'm all good, good to go? Excellent. I'm going to go check out the uh, real estate in Nansha in the meantime. And uh, thank you very much for your time. This has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour for the week of 29th of March to 4th of April, 2021. Uh, we will see you next week. Be on the lookout on April 12th for the release of our next long form episode with the Secure World Foundation and Kalis Foundation as well. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.